So it's my pleasure today to introduce um, Professor uh, Andreas uh, Fichtner, um, who is at ETH uh, Zurich in the Department of Earth Science. Um, he uh, comes uh, to ETH um, with a PhD from the University of Munich, where he worked on uh, full seismic uh, waveform inversion uh, problems uh, and did his postdoc at Utrecht. And before that, he was at, uh, at Freiburg University, and he tells me briefly also in, in Washington for a year. Um, and we, uh, we invited on Andreas and, and folks from his team because we were really interested in learning more about distributed acoustic sensing in the world of fiber optic uh, seismology um, with you know, applications to potentially lots of, of interesting environments that many people at the Institute and Jackson School more broadly are interested in from volcanic to glacial to perhaps even planetary possibilities. Um, so I guess with that, I will let uh, Andreas uh, take it away. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and of course for the opportunity to uh, to present our work to to you apologies that uh, that i can't be there in person i have to be here in toronto but uh, but i hope that i will bump into some of you during a couple of of meetings that hopefully now take place in person again also before starting i have to say that the work that i will present is by no means just my work it's uh it's a collaboration over many years with uh with many people, PhD students, postdocs, and colleagues at ETH, but also at different universities, and uh, some of the names are listed here. Now, I want to start with the slide that you see here, with the picture that you see. The person that's that's walking there, that, that is actually me carrying a fiber optic cable through the Alps. Uh, between the ridge that I'm walking on and, uh, and the higher mountains that you see in the background is the Rhone Glacier, which is one of the the big iconic glaciers in Switzerland. And what we did is we deployed that fiber optic cable that I'm carrying there on the surface of, of that glacier. Uh, that already brings me to, uh, to some of the, the main motivations of my talk. Uh, what I want to, to explain is how such a standard fiber optic cable can actually be used as, as a seismic sensor to capture, for example, environmental signals on an alpine glacier what the advantages and disadvantages of this technology actually are and, and what potential niches of this technology might be. And of course also, um, if and how this technology can provide some, some new physical insight, and as you will see, this will mostly be in cases and applications where dense seismometers networks, so dense networks of conventional uh, instruments are difficult or impossible to employ either for logistical or financial reasons. That directly relates to, to the structure of my talk. In the first part, which is the longer one, I want to show you a few case studies of uh, distributed fiber optic sensing, specifically in volcanic and glacial environments, which is what my group has been focusing on mostly during the past couple of years. And then the second part, which is shorter and a bit more theoretical, I want to show you something that is different from the distributed fiber optic sensing that many are already used to, and that is uh, integrated fiber optic sensing. Those technologies are they are emerging, they're being developed, and I want to introduce you to those technologies and show you how they work and what their potentials might be. So part one, uh, case studies of uh, distributed fiber optic sensing. And uh, before showing specific cases, I want to very briefly introduce what that distributed fiber optic sensing actually is. So most often, this is actually called distributed acoustic sensing or DAS, which is a misnomer because of course it does not only record acoustic signals, but also seismic signals from, from elastic waves. But still that, that's how it's being called and, uh, and I will stick to that. The, the measurement principle of DAS is, uh, so the basics are, are very simple. I'll try to, to draw in my slide. Uh, so what it aims to do is to, is to measure seismic ground deformation using fiber optic cables. And the basic idea is as follows. A laser pulse is sent into, into a single fiber, and that fiber, unfortunately, is, uh, is not perfect. I mean, for, for telecom people, this is unfortunate, but for us, it's actually a lucky coincidence. Those, uh, those optical fibers they always contain little impurities, little scatterers that, um, that interact with the incoming pulse and send 
a backscattered pulse back into what is called the interrogation unit or IU. So that interrogation unit or the DAS interrogator, it serves as both uh, an emitter of those laser pulses, but also as a receiver. Now imagine that, uh, that this little piece of, uh, of fiber is now being stretched by, by a certain length delta L. And that stretching will move those scatterers by a tiny bit. And as a consequence of the displacement of the scatterers, the next backscattered pulse, so the backscattering from the next laser pulse that's sent into the fiber, will arrive with a little phase delay. And that phase delay can be measured, and it's being measured repeatedly from many successive laser pulses, and can then be translated into distributed strain along that fiber. Now, so it's based on, on backscattering of laser pulses and, uh, and the minimum channel spacing, effective channel spacing that one can achieve with commercial units that, that are available is about 25 centimeters. So this is like having something like a seismometer every 25 centimeters, potentially over tens of kilometers of fiber optic cable. Uh, the potentials are, are quite enormous. Um, one can achieve very high spatial resolution at very low cost per channel. So the cost per channel that we had in, uh, in most of our experiments during the post past couple of years was on the order of $10. Uh, and that included the, uh, the installation, the logistics, the transport, and so on and so forth. Also, one can use pre-existing cables that have been installed, for example, for telecommunication. That is particularly attractive in, in urban environments where the deployment of dense seismometer networks might be challenging or impossible. And sometimes the uh, deployment of long cables is, uh, is actually quite easy, even in terrain that by itself might be difficult to access. And, uh, and this includes, for example, glaciers, active volcanoes, unstable slopes, and so on and so forth. Now, following this little introduction, I want to, to transition into those, uh, to those case studies. And the first one that I want to present relates to the, to the title slide, and it comes from, from the Rhone Glacier in the Swiss Alps. So what you see here on this slide is, uh, is a famous comparison of what the Rhone Glacier looked like in 1850 and what it looked like in 2010. And you see that it's uh, quite dramatically affected by, uh, by warming, by climate warming. When we performed our experiments in uh, 2020 and 2021, the, uh, the tongue of the glacier actually ended about here. And all of that area has become, has become a lake. So it's receding uh, very, very quickly. The Rhone Glacier is a, is a temperate alpine glacier. It's at an elevation of a bit more than 2,000 to about 3,600 meters and covers an area of, uh, of about 15, cubic, uh, 15 square kilometers and has a total length of about eight kilometers. What we did during our experiment, we deployed seismic instruments in the lower part of the, uh, of the glacier. This is uh, what is marked, the area is marked by this uh, red uh, rectangle. And we deployed two different kinds of instruments, a one kilometer fiber optic cable and three seismometers. The fiber optic cable was deployed in the form of a triangle. This is, uh, this is what you see here. And in each of the corners, we deployed one of the seismometers. And the important thing to note here is that the deployment of both the three seismometers and the fiber optic cable took about one hour. So loosely speaking, in one hour of deploying three seismometers, we got three sensors. And in one hour of deploying a one kilometer fiber optic cable, we got 1,000 sensors. In the following slides, you will see some examples of, of signals that we were able to record. And, uh, and what you see is, uh, um, is both recordings from, of, of strain rate from the DAS, this is in black, and from the seismometers. So this is uh, velocity, displacement velocity in nanometer per second. They're slightly offset simply for visibility. It's not that they were recorded at different times. 
And what you see here in this slide is uh, it's a signal from a surface ice quake in a period range of about one to 30 hertz. And since the source was near the surface, it's largely dominated by Rayleigh waves. But we also fired explosions. This is uh, a signal from such an explosion. You very nicely see the P wave and the Rayleigh wave in both the DAS data and the seismometer data. And you see that for both, the data quality is actually quite high. This is the signal from a rock fall at five to five to 30 Hertz. We could even locate those rock falls using those data. And again, you see that, uh, that the signal quality for both the seismometers and, uh, and the DAS is, uh, is, is very nice and actually quite comparable. And finally, what we were mostly interested in were signals from stick slip ice quakes. So these are ice quakes that occur at the interface between the glacier and the underlying bedrock. And these had frequencies of about one to 100 Hertz. And there also we see, we see P waves, S waves, and, uh, and they could be used to locate those events. And that is what we did. That was from a glaciological point of view, most interesting. Um, and what you see on this slide and this figure is a comparison of the location using the three seismometers that we were able to install and the DAS cable. So here, each of the, each of the green dots that you see is a plausible location of a stick slip ice quake using the three seismometers. And you see that that point cloud is pretty wide, basically saying that uh, the uncertainty in the location is very large. If in contrast to the three seismometers, we use this triangular DAS cable, we are able to collapse this point cloud into this little black one, meaning that using the DAS data, we can really greatly improve the location accuracy compared to the seismometer data. Now, what is interesting is that during the deployment, which was just about one week, 40 other, 48 other stick slip events occurred. They have very similar waveforms, typically with correlation coefficients above 0.98. So these are almost exact repeating events. And using the DAS data, we can infer that they all belong to essentially the same slip patch at the interface between glacier and, and bedrock. So some preliminary conclusions from this use case. Uh, what we saw, and that was one of the most important findings actually, was that the deployment of fiber optic cables on glaciers is actually logistically feasible and not particularly difficult. Uh, a snow cover, just say 10 centimeters of snow, is already sufficient to provide good coupling and to shield the cable from the atmosphere and provide good data quality. And, uh, and with similar logistical effort, the DAS array provides really significantly improved location accuracy. And, uh, and what we were able to do from a glaciological point of view is to infer that we, uh, that all of those stick slip ice quakes are actually confined to, to a single cluster within a few meters. The next use case was a little bit more adventurous and that comes from Mount Meager in Western Canada. What you see here is the peak of Mount Meager during the experiment. A few words about the setting. Mount Meager is, uh, is an active volcano. It's, it's not terribly active. The most eruption is thousands of years ago. And it's actually most famous for a gigantic landslide that occurred a couple of years ago and that displaced about 50 million cubic meters of material. The reason why Mount Meager is, uh, is interesting is that uh, it has the highest geothermal potential in Canada. It also hosts a glacier that is thinning quite rapidly due to climate change. And uh, what we did during the, uh, the experiment, we deployed a three kilometer long cable, which you see here in red, at about 2,100 meter altitude. And that delivered 380 channels. So 380 effective seismometers spaced at about eight meters. So this video should give you a little bit of an impression of what that uh, experiment looked like. I hope I get it to run. Let's see. Or not want to run. No. Nope. No, 
apparently doesn't like it. So uh, I'll you might turn I the pointer off and try it. Sorry, you might turn the pointer off and try it. Um, how do I turn off the pointer? <laughs> um, just click the yeah, just click that so it turns it off. One more time. There you go. Now it's off. Oh, it was off. Uh, I think it's still on. Ah. Um. Yeah, somehow it doesn't seem to be an option to uh, to turn it off. Um, yeah, well, I'll I'll continue. It's not it's not that important. It basically gave some gives some impressions of the of the fieldwork. Um, what you see here is uh, some of the data that we collected, and uh, these are thirty minutes of data from September twentieth, twenty nineteen, and you see fifteen neighboring channels. If you were to look at one of those individually, like if you only had a single channel sitting there on Mount Meager, you would probably come to the conclusion that you're seeing seismic noise. But when you plot them next to each other, you see quite nicely that uh, that this is not at all seismic noise. It is uh, it's actually coherent signal. So you can even at high frequencies, literally compare those traces wiggle by wiggle. And remember, they are spaced at about eighty at about eighty eight meters, and uh, and this is quite characteristic for the whole four weeks of the uh, of the experiment. So um so what this shows first of all is that instrumental noise is actually quite low. So the the amplitude that you have here is about 10, 10 nano strain per second. And then since you see coherent signal, it's for sure not optical noise. That means we, we get good coherent signal at those very low um, strain amplitudes. And, uh, and our interpretation of the signal is that we are actually looking at, uh, at volcanic tremor, which in the case of Mount Meager was actually not known before. So this is a, a new kind of environmental signal for, for Mount Meager. And, uh, and again, using a sin single seismometer, um, this would for sure have been interpreted as noise. So this is one of the benefits of using DAS in such a setting. Um, also, this movie is not running. I'll try something else. I'll quickly go out of the slideshow. And uh, I think we want to get to you on this. Now you see the video. Good. <laughs> So this is the base camp at Mount Meager. This is my PhD student deploying some conventional seismometers. This is a, a water power plant where we had the base camp. You see the, the cable drums and everything was transported with, helicop with a helicopter to the summit of Mount Meager. This is the trace of this gigantic landslide about 12 years ago. And this is this ridge where we deployed the fiber optic cable. So we trenched the cable in the, in the snow with the chainsaw. And it's actually quite serious work. So, uh, so doing this a whole day, uh, yeah, not quite easy, even though it looks fun here. So there again, you see uh, what the what the landslide did to the vegetation, to the forest. Good, and now I can hopefully show you this movie as well. Yeah, so uh, uh, what we also recorded during those four weeks were about 4,000 high frequency earthquakes. So here you see one of them. And if I let the movie running much longer, you, you would see many more. And, uh, and that came as a surprise because uh, the, the seismometer or the, the geophone network that has been installed around Mount Meager actually did not record those 4,000 high frequency events. So, so they, for some reason, went missing. 
and we only saw them with the DAS cable, uh, which really attests to, to the data quality. So quite often it is said that the data quality of DAS is not great, uh, but this is actually an example where the data quality is so good that you capture uh, events that a regional geopoint network did not get. Um, also here, many of those events are very similar in, in location and probably also in source mechanism. You see two examples, the one to the left. Um, these are events that, uh, that repeat almost exactly within a couple of minutes or even within a couple of seconds. And to the right, you see an example where almost the same event repeats every couple of days. We were able to do beam forming. A location was not really possible because the topography and the structure of Mount Meager is too difficult. Uh, but the beam forming shows that, uh, that those events tend to cluster. And most of those, uh, those clusters, those event clusters, are located in the direction of the main peak of, uh, of Mount Meager. So, so here are some preliminary conclusions. What we saw here is that the deployment of a fiber optic cable, even on a quite unaccessible, active, ice-covered volcano is actually feasible. Um, so that really opens a whole new range of, uh, of applications for fiber optic seismology. The trenching uh, in the snow and the ice provides uh, good coupling and the data quality is quite remarkable. And uh, from a geoscientific point of view, what was most interesting was the detection of all of those uh, signals, events that were not known before. Uh, the volcanic tremor at low frequency, uh, the high frequency events at, uh, at, high, at more than five hertz. And of course, all of those are important and interesting, keeping in mind that one wants to do uh, seismic monitoring of a potential geothermal reservoir. The next uh, and last use case I want to show you comes from, from Iceland, from Grimsvörten volcano. What you see here on this slide is a satellite image from the last major eruption of that volcano about 11 years ago. Grimsvörten is uh, it's Iceland's most active, at least on a decadal timescale, volcano, and it's also one of the largest ones. The last major eruption, as I just said, uh, was in 2011. And the caldera of that volcano is about 10 kilometers in diameter. So it's a, it's a very serious volcano. The whole volcano is covered by Europe's largest glacier, which is called Batna Jökull, and, uh, and it features a subglacial lake. So that lake is kept fluid through the, the geothermal heating of the volcano. Grimsvörten produces quite significant natural hazard uh, from subglacial floods that tend to destroy infrastructure, uh, roads and so on and so forth. Also, the ash clouds are a threat to, to aviation. They, uh, they reach to more than 15 kilometer height. And also Grimsvörten actually has a climate impact. What we did uh, in spring last year is we deployed 12 kilometers of fiber optic cable around and inside the caldera of Grimsvörten. So the cable is shown in the figure as the, as the black dashed line. So it encircles roughly half of the caldera and uh, then goes to the central point of to the central point of it. And uh, we really uh, wanted to do fundamental blue sky research. We wanted to see is actually such an experiment possible at all? What kinds of signal would we record? Um, can we improve earthquake detection and location? And uh, do we potentially detect signals that the regional seismometer network would miss? Also, here are some impressions uh, of the of the deployment. The, uh, the colleagues in Iceland built a trenching machine for us that you see here in action. So the cable goes, uh, goes into a snowplow. The snowplow makes a trench in the ice, and then the cable comes out of the plow at about 50 centimeter depth. And, uh, and it turns out that that provided uh, really perfect coupling of the cable. Some impressions from uh, what, uh, what Grimsvörten looks like. Uh, this is a picture of sun, uh, around sunset, and, uh, and the cable was deployed roughly from the position of the drone around the caldera, and then it went to the central point of the caldera. And the interrogator was placed in one of those research huts at the highest point of the, of the, of the caldera run. This at the central point of the caldera, the cliffs that you see here on the other side, they are about 300 meters high. And, and the glacier here is also about 300 meter thick. 
and below the glacier in the caldera is the subglacial lake. This is an impression of the of the data that we that we collected. The strong signal that you see here is a small local earthquake, and we detected about 1,000 of those per week. And this is interesting because the seismometer that is installed near one of those research huts detected about two orders of magnitude less events. So with the fiber optic cable that we had there, we recorded about 100 times more local volcanic earthquakes than the regional seismometer network. But what is also interesting, and that is what caught my, my attention, is this con nearly continuous oscillation that you see in the background. And that oscillation, it really is there during the whole experiment. It has a frequency of almost exactly 0.22 Hertz. So it's for all practical purposes, a monochromatic oscillation. And it is only very weakly correlated with the, uh, the amplitudes of the ambient seismic waves a seismic wave field that comes from the ocean. So, uh, so what actually happens here is that uh, that we see an oscillation of the ice sheet on top of the subglacial lake. So, for example, here in blue, we have compression from the downbending of the ice sheet, and at that time, at the same at the same moment, we have extension near the flanks of of that floating ice sheet. So that means Roughly every five seconds, the ice sheet as a whole moves about 0.5 meters up and down. So we have a standing flexural wave that causes this extension and compression that we were able to record with the dust cable. Here's uh, the signal in the frequency domain. So on the, on the x-axis, you have frequency in hertz. On the y-axis, uh, you see, you see uh, the, ampli the, the spectral amplitude of all of the dust channels, so the average of the dust channels inside the caldera, and the colors refer to the, to the time of the day. So in black, this is between midnight and 1 a.m., and in light gray, this is between noon and, and 1 p.m. And what you see is that during that day, during, during half a day, the spectral amplitude of this oscillation is almost constant. And it can be fit very nicely with the spectrum of a simple one-dimensional damped harmonic oscillator with a Q of about 15. So it basically means that the floating ice sheet behaves like an oscillating spring, like a damped oscillating spring. So, so macroscopically, it is a very simple mechanical system, even though, of course, the system in, in reality is, is a very complicated one. Now, this behavior of the spectrum is in contrast to the behavior of the, of the ambient noise that you record at the coastal stations. So here we are looking specifically at this coastal station KVI, which uh, predominantly records ambient noise from the ocean waves. And there you see that the, uh, the amplitude spectrum during the same half day varies by a factor of about three within just those 12 hours. And, uh, and the spectrum is also much broader than the oscillation spectrum of the caldera, which basically tells us that we are really looking at two different phenomena and that this oscillation of the caldera is, uh, is really a, 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 separate, a separate phenomenon. So what we were then able to do is to, to estimate the spectrum of the, of the effective forces that are driving this oscillation. And so this oscillation is damped, which means if there were no driving forces, it would just stop to exist very quickly after a few oscillations. So it means there have to be some driving forces that actually keep the oscillation running. And, and what you see here is the, the amplitude of those, of those effective driving forces as a function of time during the experiment. And the experiment ran for, for 21 days. So what you see very clearly is there, that there are always some low frequency sources that act basically continuously and drive this oscillation. And our interpretation is that we are here seeing volcanic tremor that is related to, to geothermal activity. Also, here are some preliminary conclusions. Um, it's very clear that the DAS deployment outperforms the local seismometer array, that we detect those high frequency local earthquakes that the seismometer array misses. And we also see this, uh, this curious 
and previously unknown ice sheet resonance. So essentially what that ice sheet resonance is, it, uh, it's an amplification effect. Essentially the, uh, the, uh, the floating ice sheet acts as a loudspeaker that amplifies the, uh, or the low amplitude volcanic tremor that otherwise would just not be visible. And we think that especially in cases of those uh, ice covered volcanoes, this may be uh, a new and admittedly quite exotic way of, of monitoring those volcanoes. So this brings me to part two of my talk, which, uh, which is about an emerging technology, and this is so-called integrated fiber optic sensing. And before explaining what integrated fiber optic sensing is, I want to motivate its development. The main motivation comes from the limited interrogation distance of DAS of distributed acoustic sensing. And that interrogation distance for typical available DAS units is about 40 kilometers. And this simply is because it is based on backscattered pulses that are anyway weak. And when they travel a long distance, they're simply being attenuated. And after about 40 kilometer distance, there's no exploitable signal anymore. So this is the main motivation. An alternative to backscattered based DAS are transmission-based systems. Now, how do they work? The, the, the basic idea is very simple. A laser pulse is sent into one end of the fiber, travels through the fiber, and is received on the other side after some, after some travel time. Now, as the fiber deforms, the fiber stretches, and also the deformation of the fiber actually leads to a change in the refractive index. And so the combination of those two effects causes a phase delay, delta phi, and that phase delay delta phi can be measured as a function of time, right? And, uh, and then what one can show is that this phase delay delta phi that results from deformation of the fiber is an integral over strain along the fiber. Right? So that's why it's called integrated fiber optic sensing. So this has advantages and disadvantages. The, uh, the disadvantage is, or the apparent disadvantage is that you have an integrated measurement. So one would intuitively expect that you lose spatial resolution or that you may not have any spatial resolution at all. I'll well, then later show you that this is actually not the case, but for the moment, it seems like losing spatial resolution is essentially the price that you have to pay for having a longer interrogation distance. But what is nice about this equation up here is that it allows us to directly compare the DAS measurements to the integrated measurements, because what DAS gives us is actually the integrant, right? So DAS gives us strain along the fiber. And if we want to compare two systems, so a distributed and an integrated one, we simply have to integrate the data from DAS along the DAS line, and then we get, we can synthesize the, the measurement from an inherently integrated sensing system. And, uh, and this is what we did. So we, we performed an experiment in, in Athens together with several colleagues from different universities in and around Athens. And, uh, and we deployed our interrogators in, in Northern Athens in a suburb called Marusi. And we had two interrogators. So we had a standard, DAS interrogator, and next to it was an interrogator that performed integrated deformation sensing. And it's an interrogator that actually these colleagues built themselves from scratch. And we inter interrogated a fiber optic cable, a, a commercial fiber optic cable that, uh, that is about 30 kilometers long and traverses the northern suburbs of Athens. And we looked at one specific earthquake from, from Crete. So that occurred down here in, uh, in eastern, eastern Crete. And these are the DAS recordings from this earthquake. So it was a magnitude 6.3 earthquake. So that is a quite serious one for, for this island. It occurred on October 12, 2021. And, uh, and you quite clearly see the, uh, the P onset of that, uh, of that earthquake recorded by our DAS array. And so you have distance along the cable 
in the y direction and, uh, and time uh, on the x axis. And then what we did, we, we took those distributed measurements, integrated them along the cable, and then tried to reproduce the integrated measurements that our Greek colleagues were doing with their newly built system. And this is, uh, this is one of the results. So in blue, you see the time series from the inherently integrated sensor, and in orange, the integrated dust signal. And you see that at, uh, at frequencies between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 hertz, those signals agree pretty well. This also works for different frequency bands. Now it becomes more difficult to compare them wiggle by wiggle, but still, even at higher frequencies, 0.1 to 5 hertz, they, they match almost perfectly. You know, below, you see a zoom. right? And given that, uh, that this integrated system just had been assembled a few weeks before from very cheap components that you could basically buy on Amazon, uh, this, is, uh, this is a quite remarkable match. So the, problem, the comparison is really promising, given that this was really the first shot. It shows that this integrated sensing system in principle works. And of course, here the interesting thing is that this system that the colleagues in Greece built costs about 50 times less than our commercial dust system. So instead of just running one, you could actually imagine running many of those. So, but of course, there's this disadvantage of having an integrated measurement that apparently does not have any spatial resolution. And, uh, and the question that we ask, is there, is there anything that can be, that can be done about this, about this problem? And it turns out that, uh, that indeed there are possibilities. Now, this involves a little bit of math. I will not go through the derivation, but the key point is that this phase difference that this integrated system measures as a function of time, and which is an integral of a strain along the fiber, can also be written in an alternative form. So in a form that is mathematically exactly equivalent. So again, we have this phase difference as a function of time, and it can also be written as an integral over local fiber curvature times displacement or seismic displacement of the fiber. And so these two equations are completely equivalent. So here's an illustration of, uh, of what this means. Uh, it's, a, it's a toy example. It's a numerical toy example. It's wave propagation in, in just two dimensions. It's analytical. And you see a wave, a circular wave front emanating from a source here at the position of the black star. And that wave front travels towards two fiber optic cables. The black one has a small curvature and is about 2,000 kilometers long. And the red one is only about 1,000 kilometers long, but it has a higher curvature. And so these are both sinusoids. And the black one has a relatively low curvature compared to the red one. On the right-hand side, you see the integrated phase changes that those two fibers produce when they record the displacement from this incoming wave. Let's first look at the black one that we see here, and that corresponds to, to the black cable with the low curvature. And the first important thing to note is that even though there's only one wave hitting the cable, you see two pulses. And those two pulses that you see here, they correspond to two different high curvature segments of the cable. Right, so this e equation up here tells you that the signal is predominantly made by those parts of the cable that have a high curvature. Right? And if you have different high curvature points of the cable, then those different high curvature points will produce you a signal at different times. Now, the other important thing to look at for the short cable, which has a higher curvature, is that well, again, you have two different pulses. So this is the red signal that we see here. You have two different pulses coming from two different high curvature points along the cable. But what is interesting here is that actually the amplitude of those pulses 
is roughly the same as the amplitude of the pulses that we have for the long cable. Right? So this is simply because the, the length of the cable is compensated by the higher curvature. Right? So the cable only has about half the length, but it has twice the curvature. And, uh, and they compensate for each other. Good. So, so what does this imply? It implies that strongly curved fiber segments are actually more sensitive to deformation. And if those high curvature fiber segments have sufficient spacing from another, then they may produce individual distinguishable wiggles in the time series. Okay. So now one can drive this a little bit further and ask the question how the, uh, the arrival time of those individual wiggles, so of individual time windows, actually depends on the structure of the Earth. Now we look into a zoomed version of the time series. So, uh, so we have this, the black time series here. And on the next slide, we just zoom into, into this time window. Right? So this is, this is now what you have here. It's the same time window, but zoomed in. And so what we did is we picked one time window, shown here in gray. And we asked the question, how does the arrival time of the wiggle within that time window depend on the p-velocity structure of the Earth? And to, do, to answer this question, we simply computed a sensitivity kernel using adjoint methods. And this is what the sensitivity kernel looks like. So the sensitivity kernel looks like a traditional banana donut kernel, and it connects the source to one of those high curvature points. Right, and this underlines the point that I made before, that it is the high curvature points along the cable that actually dominate the signal. Right? So if you look at this, at this window here, you're seeing a specific part of the Earth that connects the source to one of the high curvature points. Of course, now there are variations of the scene. If you look into a different time window, this one, then your sensitivity kernel looks different. It connects the source to different high curvature points. And as a consequence, this window actually sees a different part of the earth. And you can drive this further, different time window, different high curvature point, different part of the earth, and so on and so forth. Right? So that basically means that by analyzing this time series in different time windows, we actually achieve spatial resolution that allows you to, if you will, look at different parts of the Earth. So this, in, in summary, this means that the analysis of integrated measurements in time window, in different time windows, actually mimics distributed measurements, right? So it is an inherently integrated measurement, but you can make it, it you can turn it into a distributed measurement by having a time-dependent analysis. So this brings me to the, to the final conclusions of my, of my talk. I'm at about 45 minutes now. Um, concerning the distributed sensing, uh, what we have seen is that the deployment of long cables, I means more than 10 kilometers in, in difficult volcano glacial environments is actually logistically feasible. So this opens opportunities for, for more studies in this direction for volcano and glacial seismology. Um, it provides, uh, it allows us to achieve uh, good coverage that, uh, that traditional instruments cannot provide, at least not with some reasonable effort. The data quality can be very good. Actually, it can be really amazing, provided that the cable is shielded from the atmosphere. And shielding from the atmosphere here means to bury it to a few tens of centimeters of depth, say 10, 20, 30 centimeters, in order to protect it from wind and temperature variations. And uh, so far, we have focused on characterization of seismicity. Um, we have been able to achieve improvements of location accuracy to the point where we could see event clusters that previously were not distinguishable, uh, increase the number of detected events, actually typically by orders of magnitude, and also uh, find previously unknown forms of events and deformation and examples that we have seen is the, uh, are the, the tremor, the volcanic tremor on Mount Meager, 
but also this resonance phenomenon that we have seen uh, on Green's virtual volcano. And then finally, the integrated sensing, we have seen that it provides uh, measurements of deformation-induced phase changes of transmitted instead of backscattered laser pulses. It is still under development. So this, the systems that the colleagues in Athens are building are all prototype systems. Uh, and, but even though they're integrated measurements, they can actually mimic distributed measurements through time-dependent analysis. And, uh, and I think that if one drives this a little bit further, one may actually use those systems for seismic tomography uh, and earthquake location and characterization. And uh, that is all I have. Thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, thanks for a uh, uh, great talk. Um, okay, we're gonna take some uh, questions. Is this ready to go here? All right, questions in the room? Yeah, we got one in the back. Ed, can you? Um... All right. Tossing around the microphone. Okay. Hi, right, thank you very much. That was a great talk. This is John Goff. Uh, I was just wondering if it's, po I mean, you're using, uh, uh, fiber optic cables that were manufactured for telecommunications, right? I was just wondering if it's possible to manufacture a cable that's specific for this purpose so that it has stronger scatters and could be more optimized mm -hmm. for, for this kind of purpose. Yeah, so so actually the cables that we are using, so say, the of course, the, the telecommunication cables that we use in Athens or other cities, of course, they have been made for telecommunication, of course. Uh, the ones that we used on the volcanoes, uh, glaciers, and other applications, they were actually made uh, for this purpose. So, so they are made by a small company in Switzerland. They're mostly uh, uh, they're mostly interested in military applications, actually, uh, like detecting submarines and so on and so forth. And and they're made for sensing applications. Uh, the point with more scatterers. Um, so, if your cable is short this might actually bring something and this is being done. But uh, if you have more scatterers, you also reduce the distance to which you can interrogate the cable right? because you have uh, you have stronger losses. So this is the trade-off that you have. So, so you need to have, you need to know very well uh, what application you have in mind. It's a, it's, it's a trade-off that is not an easy one. Thanks. Right, so, so just having more scatterers not necessarily improves data quality because uh, you have stronger attenuation along the fiber. Great. Okay. Other questions? Well, I guess I have a. Uh, we have anything on that? No, nothing yet. Okay. Great. Um, I have just a, a couple ones on integrated versus distributed. Are the uh, the power requirements basically the same? Because you're still using the same laser. Um, yeah, no, the power requirements of the integrated one, I, ca I can't tell you a number, but I can tell you that it's a lot lower. Uh, so the, the system that the colleagues in Athens developed, uh, it actually works with, uh, with microwave signals. So they are not sending uh, high frequency laser signals into the fiber, but uh, they are actually microwave frequency uh, signals. And, uh, and apparently the power requirements are a lot lower. I, I don't have a number. But also, since it's microwave microwave frequency, you actually uh, have a you have a longer reach, and uh, and it's easier to manufacture. The microwave lasers are a lot cheaper than uh, than an ultra stable laser that would be uh, in a DAS interrogation unit. And they both go farther and have less energy requirements. Yep. But, right, interesting. Hi. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, so. Does this just work for local, or could you lose like telecommunications beneath the oceans and try and get coverage yes. of the ocean? Right. So that is that is that is the idea of this uh, of of this microwave integrated system. So uh, we haven't done in such an experiment with that, but uh, based on the calculations, you should be able to uh, to cover uh, tens of thousands of kilometers with this system. So it should definitely be possible to cross ocean basins. Then you, uh, hi, excellent talk. But then you mentioned a lot of spatial resolution. 
And so how this you gonna mitigate that? And and what is exactly you mean by special resolution? Like what what are we talking about uh, in terms of uh, depth of penetration and uh, regional you mean, uh, coverage? You you mean of the integrated of the integrated system? Yes. Oh, okay. So what I mean by spatial resolution is uh, is spatial resolution of the uh, of the sensing itself, right? Not necessarily spatial resolution of say the tomography that you do with the data. And uh, and that spatial resolution depends on it depends on the geometry of the cable, and it depends on the frequency of the signal. Right. So let's forget about the frequency of the signal for the moment. Um, so if you have if you have those high curvature points spaced at say ten kilometer distance through an ocean basin, then you would have an effective sensor every 10 kilometers right so so that is not the 25 centimeter spatial resolution that you would have with distributed acoustic sensing but uh, but having say 10 kilometer spacing of sensors within the oceans uh, would be a gigantic improvement compared to what we have at the moment right so and then uh, a lot depends on whether those high curvature points along the cable actually produce individually distinguishable wiggles in your time series. And that depends on frequency. Right? So if, you're, if, you're, if your frequencies are very low, then the two high curvature points, let's say 10 kilometer spacing, may still produce low frequency wiggles that overlap and that cannot be individually distinguished. And so this is the trade-off. Um, but uh, but just to stick with that number and to stick with global seismology, I think if you if you have ten kilometer spacing, uh, then that should be good for for most of the teleseismic earthquakes that we are recording, and it should enable yeah the recording of individual wiggles that transform this integrated sensor into a distributed sensor where you have a measurement point every ten kilometers just to have that number. That's great. Now we have an online. Yeah, Kyle, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So can you comment on the directional sensitivity of these cables? Uh, yeah. I guess so, separately, one for the for the DAS measurements you did, and then mm -hmm. also for the integrated um, right. system mm -hmm. afterwards. Yes. So the, the distributed acoustic sensing, uh, it measures strain along the fiber. Right. Right. So it is a, it is a one component measurement, which depending on the application you have in mind could be a disadvantage. Right. So so that uh, that comes back to the question: What is actually the niche of this technology? Right. If you have an application where you require a three component measurement, then DAS is is not your thing. Um, so so that is the directional sensitivity there. Um, so that means, for example, if you have a P wave with a polarization that is parallel to the DAS cable, you will not record that P wave, for example. Now, the integrated sensing has a vectorial sensitivity. So the sensitivity is vector valued, and it is proportional to the curvature vector of the cable. Or to be more precise, it's, uh, it's proportional to the, uh, to the derivative of the tangent vector along the fiber. And so uh, that that means that you have uh, that you have maximum sensitivity when the curvature is high, and when you have a wave with a polarization that is parallel to the curvature vector. But uh, but you will be blind to waves with a polarization that is perpendicular to the curvature vector. Okay. All right. So it's 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 a more it's more complicated than with DAS because right. uh, that because the sensitivity is not only dependent on on the polarization of the wave, but also on the geometry of of the fiber. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Of course. Please. So for the for particularly for the uh, uh, the deployment in Iceland, can you mm -hmm. uh, this is a should be a quick question. Um, how much vertical uh, relief 
was along those 12 kilometers that the cable was sitting in. And the, the reason to ask is since the, the apparent uh, uh, very continuous monochromatic um, compression mm -hmm. above the glacial lake was almost vertical as you claim. So how much sensitivity or how much directionality of the cable was actually in a vertical sense? In other words, oh, how much uh, relief? How much relief was in? Uh, oh, there, there was uh, okay. So there was there was no sensitivity in the vertical direction. Uh, what we see is the uh, is the horizontal deformation that results okay. from that uh, from that oscillation, right? Okay. So, so when, for example, when the when the when the caldera bends downwards, then you would have compression near or horizontal compression near the central point of the caldera. And you would have extension near the rim, horizontal extension. And then when it warps upwards, you have the opposite. And I think this is the signal that we are seeing. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one more in, in the room here. Hi, thanks for a, a nice talk. Um, so I've heard a little bit about using seismic noise to investigate like hydrology beneath glaciers or um, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Is that something that you might be able to use with this type of system or do with that? This type um, so we actually we actually do. We are working on this together with uh, with colleagues at University of Washington in, in Seattle. And um, so they're actually using the, da the data from the Rhone Glacier that we uh, this, that we collected, not during the experiment that I showed. But during a follow-up experiment that we did in summer, and uh, and there the signal is has a strong component from from meltwater and from the hydrological system of the glacier, and they think they can uh, they can quantify, for example, the, uh, the 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 runoff, the volume of the runoff, and so on and so forth. But this is really ongoing. But um, but that information is definitely contained in those data. So this is possible. Okay, that's exciting. I'm kind of thinking about the potential for like circulation within the the lake in the caldera in. in ah, Iceland. I see. Yeah. Too far. So or something so this, well. so well. during the time when we were there, there was probably not significant circulation okay. in that lake. Um, there is, however, significant circulation once the once the lake breaks out. So when the when the hydrostatic pressure in the lake becomes too high. It actually breaks through the caldera rim, and uh, and that is something that would probably produce a pretty strong signal. But we were not there at that time, so that actually happened a few months after we finished the experiment. So we don't have data for for something like that. Thank you. Great. Any more questions? Okay, we're right at eleven thirty, so that's perfect. Uh, Andreas, thanks for a fascinating talk. And Thank you very much. Uh, next time we can get you in person and feed you some tacos. I hope so. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, that was.